Welcome back to Spank Ranch Garage. Tonight we have a literal pile of broken E36 differentials and we need to build one good one for my drift car. So drift season's coming, but I don't have a rear differential for the car. I've got all these broken ones and I've got a good set of gears. So let's get to work in building one really nice diff out of all of this scrap metal. Yeah, these have been kicking around in the scrap pile for years. I don't remember exactly what's wrong with each one of them. This says it's a 293 and it actually turns and seems to feel okay. So if I had to guess, I think this one's busted bolt in the housing here or the threads are screwed up. I think I got this one in a trade and it's an open diff. I don't know why I would even have an open diff. This one here, welded. Um, all the teeth are gone off the pinion it looks like or the pinion's broken inside there, whatever. And then this one's got M3 flanges in it. So this is a recent diff. And this one also all the teeth are broken off. We got no pinion action. Um, housing wise, you'll see it's got this extra ghetto uh, tab welded on here. This is something I do so I don't shear the front diff bolt off. I've been doing this for years. I've never had a failure with that. So this is a little nicer one. This one's real ghetto. I just torch cut it and threw it in because it was probably like five hours before an event. So looking at it on the surface here, I'd say this is probably our best case to start with, but I'm sure we'll need parts out of all of these. So let's get the fluid out of these and start taking them apart. Wow, that fluid is nice. I might reuse that. She's got some confetti in this one. Now, if you were just servicing a diff, you'd have to be careful that you're getting your shims back in the right place, all that stuff. I'm starting from scratch, so it doesn't matter to me. I'm just gonna tear this thing apart. You see these small defects here on the teeth? This is what was causing some problems with this differential. So if you look in here, you'll see that the, the teeth on the pinion are damaged, right? These are supposed to look more like this, you know, more pronounced, sharp, maybe shiny. But inside here, there's actually only a little bit of the pinion left right there. So that was causing me a vibration and a noise. Pinion flange is a 30 millimeter, I believe. Uh, I have a 12 point, which isn't ideal, but you do need to make it thin wall. So you'll turn it down with a grinder, lathe, whatever. Zip that off, then the pinion flange comes off, not pressed on there too. Now, since this is absolutely destroyed, I'm not gonna bother pressing it out. We're just gonna press it out with the hammer. Your pinion seal, if you're trying to reuse it. And then that gives us a good look there at the problem with the gear. So this was causing me an immense amount of vibration, noise, bearing took a blow. I mean, this thing really took a blow. Here's your crush sleeve. This sets your preload on your pinion bearings. So we'll be keeping that. It's a similar story on this one. You can see here, we only have half of the teeth, so this one only works half the time. In operation, you have a carrier spinning this way, and it is flinging oil up into these ports here that are then landing on the pinion bearings, wetting the pinion bearings, and then coming back down through these bottom ports. What happens is when stuff's hitting the fan in here, everything flies up into this port and then collects up there. You know, we've got some full ring and pinion teeth up here and stuff, and that's to be expected. But the 391, the pinion is so small, it just doesn't have that much teeth, that many teeth in contact uh, with the ring gear. Now next to it here's a 373. It's a little better, but it ain't great. But if you look at one of these with like a 293 or even a 279, like I put in my E39, I mean, it's like the size of a beer can. The pinion is so big. You'll never really break one of those. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you're very unlikely to. Where, you know, these 391s, the pinion is just such a little fuse. I mean, you look at them the wrong way and they blow up, so. Something to keep in mind when selecting a ratio, the lower numerically the ratio, the stronger the rear will be. Now I'm gonna head in with a brass punch on the end of an extension here and knock out the front bearing race with the bearing end seal. A decent way of doing that, it kind of pushes evenly on the back of the seal. You can get these out without ruining them. Like I said, for a drift car, 
something you're playing with, that's fine. For something a little nicer, I wouldn't bother. I would just order the seal either from BMW or take this to a bearing shop and get a new seal. And then the bearings, I'm gonna be fully inspecting all these, matching up all the best bearings I can out of these rears and putting together a nice new set, new set. One more bearing to punch. So with the inner pinion bearing pressed out, this is now a totally empty housing. Take it outside, clean it up, start rebuilding. These mating surfaces need to be spotless. Crap between the carrier and the gear and you're gonna get run out and then your pattern's gonna look weird. It's gonna look okay in some spots. It's gonna look bad in other spots. Two ways to do this part here. The safest way is probably heat the ring gear slightly and then drop it on and align the bolt holes before it cools and shrinks. Or you can try to get perfectly lucky, line this thing up and, and tap it down either with a brass punch or a piece of wood, whatever. I'm gonna go ahead and heat this up and just let it drop on here. And once you get it down on there far enough, you can then draw it in the remainder of the way using the bolts. Once it's seated, I pull the bolts back out, dab a Loctite right back in, and then we're gonna to torque them. 110 foot pounds for these. The ring gear installed, our last job here with the carrier is to inspect these bearings. Luckily mine are okay, but your outer race is pressed into this thing, and then you'll need a puller to take these off. I'll show you that later. Um, go ahead and replace them if you need to. I'm not going to in this case. You need to get yourself one of these tools. This is a pinion bearing puller. Um, it works for carriers as well. It pretty well works anywhere you've got these cage type tapered roller bearings. The best part about this is it takes this stuff off without damaging it. So. The old days of like getting a grinder in here and cutting this, cracking the race, all that stuff, wasting all those bearings, um, those days are over. Put a link to the description for this tool. And as we go further with this, we're gonna see that we have to push, pull bearings on and off to shim this correctly. This tool is not too expensive now that they make Chinese ones. Uh, this used to be a very expensive tool, but now that they make these Chinese ones, you cannot beat getting one of these. Uh, it will save you money in bearings, save you frustration, save Everything, it's just a great tool. Pinion comes apart undamaged. <clears throat> and then here's your bearing. Totally fine inside here. No damage at all, really. These are very hard to pull because you can't get on this back race. These adapters fit everything from, you know, a little tiny BMW diff to a Dana 30 all the way up to a Dana 80. So definitely worth its weight in gold if you do this kind of work. So now we're gonna press the new pinion bearing on. You can set up whatever you want to get this thing on here. Just don't damage the race. Don't damage the cage. So I have another bearing that fits over top really nicely. And then I have a piece of pipe here. I'll either put this in the press, hit it with the hammer, drive that bearing home. All right, so there's four critical adjustments to building differentials in general, and it's no different with BMW differentials. First, you have your pinion depth, which is how far or how, how close or how far your pinion is from your ring gear. Then you've got your pinion preload, which will be how much drag is on the bearings based upon how tight the bearings are pulling against each other. That distance is set by a crush sleeve in the case of the BMW. The pinion depth is actually set by a shim behind the inside pinion bearing race. So it looks like that. You change the thickness of the shim to move the pinion in or out. There's a couple issues with this. Um, one, Every time you move this, your crush sleeve distance changes. Companies don't really do this anymore, but I was kind of surprised to see this. So you'll set your pinion depth with the shim behind the inside pinion bearing race. And then you set your bearing preload with this crush sleeve here. And then obviously your other bearing comes in on top like that. Your other two adjustments are going to be backlash. That's how much basically space you have between the teeth here and the ring gear. And then finally, the backlash and the carrier preload are set by changing out these shims here to thicker or thinner shims. And what you'll do is you're actually moving the carrier left and right in the case to set your backlash, and then you're adding additional shim to preload these bearings and slightly flex the case. Now, 
For me, I don't have this kind of stuff and I'm not gonna purchase these. I do have just standard shims that I would use to build other rears for other cars. These are no different. So my thoughts are, is that I will, through my part stiffs, I will pick the thinnest shim I can find, put this in behind it, and then the rest of my shimming will come from behind the bearing. I've got the puller, bearing comes off real easy. So if I wanna move my pinion depth in, I'm gonna pull the bearing off. I'm gonna throw a shim behind it, press the bearing back on, refit the case, see how we're looking, and adjust it that way, instead of adjusting it on the outer bearing race like this. If you guys do end up wanting to shim your, your uh, pinion depth through the bearing, or from the back bearing race like that, they do have these shims you can probably get online cheap. These are left over from a Dana 80 build that I did. You get a shim kit for the carrier bearings on the Dana 80. They will fit the uh, pinion bearings on the BMW. And then for the, uh, if you want to shim it the way I'm going to do it, you get these shims here. You can also get these very easily. These are for a GM 10 bolt. So like a rear out of like any half ton Chevy truck and plenty of other cars. GM 10 bolt, it's eight and a half inch ring and pinion. Very easy to get shims for. These will work for shimming the pinion and then it will also work for shimming these bearings which we're going to do as well so it fits the carrier and the pinion so we got our minty clean case in here all inspected made sure there's no chips left everything's really nice and clean so first the shim drops in like that and then our bearing race goes in on top of it and hopefully if this goes to plan that's going in and staying in we'll do all our shimming on the pinion now we're going to make what's called a setup bearing and the reason I make this is because this front pinion bearing also presses on. That's why we had to hammer the pinion out. If I'm gonna be bringing this thing in and out, I don't wanna be hammering on this, beating up these threads. So because I've got my good bearing here and I got another bearing that's not so good, we're just gonna take one of these like 99 cent Amazon flap wheels that fits in a die grinder. <laughs> And we're going to take a couple thousandths out of the inside of this. That way it'll slip right on the pinion. Use this whole bearing for setup. Gets rid of all the pressing and hammering. And then when it's time to party, we'll press the final bearing on. Give that thing a little hone job. Boom, she slides right on. That'll save a ton of hammering and crying. A little super light oil. I'll just use some spindle oil. Put your flange on. Squeeze it all together. Literally gonna hand tighten this. So there's just a little bit of back drag. All right, now we can start setting up our gear. It's nice to actually see teeth down in there. I'm gonna take out these O-rings for my setup purposes, because it just makes it harder to get in and out. More chance of damaging one, so we'll just get rid of them. Huh. We'll have to measure that. I expected this to be way off, but I have been surprised with the consistency of BMW stuff. I mean, we'll see what the pattern looks like. It might be horrible, but the carrier's got slight preload. I might want more for this application, but anyway, it's not flopping around in here. So we could actually pattern this and see where we're at. Let's go ahead and do that. Right out of the box, four and a half, Four and a half thousandths of backlash. Spec for this backlash is two and a half thou to five and a half thou. So we are at the looser side. I'd like to go tighter based upon what this thing's gonna be used for. Man guys, I'll tell you what, I don't know how well this shows up for you, but that pattern looks really good. So we are centered heel to toe on the tooth and we're also centered from the root to the top here. I really am totally okay with that pattern. Pretty good on a used set of gears. And then the coast side looks pretty good as well. I really can't complain about that. I am going to decrease the backlash slightly, which will move the pattern around a smidge, but I'm also going to, uh, I think I'm gonna actually gonna add a little preload to this side over here. And that's going to flex the case just a smidge, reducing backlash. I only need to pull about two thousandths out of it. We'll see what that does to my pattern. Hopefully it doesn't change it too much. And then that should also add a little more preload. The thought here is if you pre-stress the case, the case will already have more tension in it and it'll be less likely to spread, allowing the pinion to pull away from the ring and blow the teeth off. 
Uh, the downside of that is a little more drag. You'll probably be making more heat. Maybe you wouldn't run a road race car with a real tight carrier, but for a drift car that sees intermittent heat, no problem. With this indicator mounted to one side of the differential, indicating off the other side, we can see the preload that we are putting on the diff casing from the carrier retaining bolts. So that thing's at about zero. Watch it slowly creep up to about a thousandth of an inch. So we are only preloading the case about one one thousandth of an inch. So the deal is my thinnest shim that fits is 20 thousandths. That's a bit much, I think, but the option we do have is the actual BMW shim on this one, 65 thousandths. I have a 70 thousandth shim here from the parts diff. So you do the math, you're spacing this thing out 5 thousandths, and you're putting the bearing back in 20 for a delta of 15, and that's exactly what we're looking for. So 15 thousandths more shim stack. Let's see what kind of difference it makes. Fifteen thousandths on the shim, fifteen thousandths preload on the case. Doesn't get any more accurate than that. You guys can see that I'm not BSing you here. You got fifteen thou. Man, that's a little tight. It is backlash, but man, it's tight. On the tight side. I think the BMW spec is two and a half is the low side to go even a smidge tighter. Two, we'll call it there. It's got to have some backlash now. Coast side pattern came in. I mean, she is smack on center. Drive side pattern moved away a smidge. You can see here we're a little lower on the tooth than we were before. Still nothing to worry about. So as is, this diff is set. 15 thousandths of spread on the case. Uh, pinion depth looks good. Backlash is good. So all that's figured out. Remember, we have a setup bearing in the front of our pinion. We got to put the correct bearing on. We also need to install a crush sleeve and get the pinion preload set correctly. Setup bearing comes out. We're gonna start with our thickest crush sleeve. Give us the best chance at working. So that one's 8100, 8085. So we got three or four more thousands of crush on this one. This will be the one we use. A little oil on the front pinion bearing. You could be very precise with a long breaker bar on here and crush it precisely or you can be even carefuler with an impact gun. We're gonna give it the impact gun technique. We'll see what happens. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. So I feel some bearing preload. I'm gonna turn it a little bit, see how it feels. I can tell you right now that's a little low. Um, so we're gonna give it another bump and then we'll get the torque wrench out and see where we're at. No difference there. Okay, so the preload on this seems to be about 24, 24 inch pounds, a little stiction when you get it moving, maybe 22 inch pounds. I think the top of the spec is like 24, so we're sitting at 22, 24 inch pounds. Once again, I wouldn't do that on a street car, but on a drift car, uh, no problem. So now I mark where the pinion nut's at. Let's zip this off. The reason for marking that is we've already crushed the sleeve. We don't, we never want to go tighter than that. So we need to know where we were at. Pull the nut off, pull the flange off, put your pinion seal back in. Can't forget about that. We're gonna reuse it because we're cheap here at Spank Ranch Garage, but I'd recommend you replace this. We want it to pretty well end where it ended before. You can see it's just gonna be the lightest little tap with the impact and that's gonna be it. With that set, you can drop this locking plate on here and then bend the tabs to lock the nut in half. It's just extra insurance. That this thing isn't gonna back out on you. Final step, heat this ring up until it'll drop back on the carrier. Right on there. Now we let that shrink. Little carb cleaner to speed up the process. That thing's locked on there. Remember that these tabs go upwards because there's an oil hole here that catches splash oil, lubricates the carrier bearing. Make sure everything still turns. Okay. 
synthetic gear lube. I wanted 75, 110, of course they didn't have any. So we'll send her with the, what is this? The 145, 70, 145. Two quarts on a dry rebuild is fine. It says 1.8. We're not gonna cry about two tenths of a quart. Two ninety three diff on the left here has come out. Three seventy three is ready to go in. Two ninety three is a great rear, very strong, very street worthy, very good on a boosted car. Though unfortunately, the track that I run most commonly, it's just not ideal for the three seventy three over here. I think it's going to be really nice. I think it's a great compromise between wheel speed and durability for the tracks that I'm at. Uh, and the way it's built, hopefully, it holds up. We'll see. So let me throw this thing in here. many ways to shim these diffs you do not have to buy the diff pat the diff shims from bmw there's plenty of other cars out there that you can grab them from on amazon super cheap like i said the, the eight, eight and a half inch chevy uh the dana 80 i think the dana 30 pinion shims you know there's a bunch of different cars out there you can grab these shims from nothing special now for specs i probably wouldn't follow those unless you are just a drift guy or something like i said i built this diff very tight to hopefully give it a little extra life in drifting uh, do not do that for road race, whatever. Go follow BMW specs, build the diff that way. Same process, different specs. Another thing, the reason I broke mine in with a four gear burnout is because all the parts are already used. They're used bearings, used gears, and a used case. There's not a new part in this differential except for the fluid, so I can do that. If you actually buy new gears and new bearings, you should follow some type of break-in procedure. I don't need to because everything's used, everything's already bedded, and if it's gonna bed more, then go ahead and do it. So. Thanks for watching Spank Ranch Garage. Let me know if you got any comments and I'll see you next time.